So what was okay. that? What was that uh, Wasp tour like? Well, yeah, we toured with Wasp uh, last fall, um, and uh, it was six weeks in the U.S. And uh, you know, it was honestly amazing. Uh, the whole band and the crew were nothing but gracious uh, and uh, made our life easy. The, you know, luckily we were the only support band, so there wasn't a third band on the bill. Mm. So for us, it was like kind of like cake, you know, like we'd set up, we'd get a sound check every single day and leave our stuff set up. As you know, that's always like great, you know. So uh, the, the the whole tour was awesome. I mean, they they went out of their way to make us feel welcome, and we got made sure we had stage room. I mean, all the things that you kind of fear going in being a support yeah. band, you yeah. know. Uh, we were like really like no complaints. It was really really great. So uh, and then the audiences were amazing. Um, I'd say like at least fifty percent of the tour sold out. So the crowds were just killer. Uh, it was a great package. I think both bands celebrating 40 year anniversary that year. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a great tour. It was a lot of fun for us. Um, you know, um, it was kind of interesting because some, like some cities where we would play that were familiar to us and we played a lot like Cleveland and Chicago, places like that. Um, and so, you know, the crowds were just completely nuts, you know, and the, but then we sometimes would play other places we hadn't ever played before and where a lot of people were there kind of just for the spectacle of it. Like, you know, yeah. Wasp obviously has a big history and it's very sort of theatrical thing, you know, and so a lot of people were coming to the shows, not, not like I'd say 100% sure who we were, yeah. But, so, but we, it was, oh, you know, for us, it was like, okay, time to go to work. Like, you know, yeah. don't rest on your laurels, like get your ass out there and work. And, uh, you know, people were like, we'd win people over all over the place that were, that was sort of new territory for us. So that was, it was a good thing all around, you know, it was, we got to play for some old schoolers, but we also got to play for a lot of people that had kind of maybe heard of the band, but never seen us before. Yeah. So you always want to do that when you're on tour. It's always good to spread yourself to new to a new audience. So <clears throat> it was it was awesome. It's really really good all the way around, you know. But that's great. but that's so like what I what I want to try and um, discuss is maybe like when we were um, hanging out a few times in LA, I started to you know get into all the old stories from back in the day. And seeing as it was <laughs> forty years, I mean. So to try and um, dig into some of the memories from way in the beginning, because people are super fascinated with that sort of 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, sort of formation yeah. of the whole scene when you're sort of milling around as a teenager in L.A., trying to start bands and who was on the scene and who wasn't on the scene. I don't really yeah. know where to start to pinpoint a certain memory, but what about right at the beginning of Armored Saint or right at the beginning of the first time you saw that there was bands like from the area beginning to play and you went to see, you know, like 88 yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, if, you know, I was, I'm pretty lucky that I'm born and raised in LA. You know, we had, we've always had a pretty rich, you know, like other cities like New York and San Francisco and, you know, the bigger cities <laughs> and, and places in Europe too, you know, um, uh, I was lucky to be here, and um, so when I first started getting into music, and get, was old enough to start going out to see yeah. live concerts, and so like specifically what you're you're speaking of, it made me remember of when I first started going to clubs. I was probably fifteen, yeah, yeah. Years, fifteen years old or so, and um, that was when I started to see bands in clubs um that were from the area bands like i missed the whole van halen thing i was they were mm. a few years ahead of me um so i missed them in the clubs because as many people know they're from southern california yeah, yeah. pasadena which is our our backyard basically mm. um but there were other bands that came up just behind them and those are the bands that i got to see so bands like snow that's where carlos cavazo came okay. from of course carlos went on to play with you know, Rat and, and Quiet, Quiet Riot. Riot. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I got to see Snow. There were other bands in the in the that 
sort of realm like called uh, there was a band called um smile there was a band called uh you know ready kilowatt who was kind of a contemporary of van halen um so we started going to see clubs at the starwood oh yeah and i got to see bands at the starwood which is a famous defunct club that was back in the big in the 70s and uh, early 80s it just shut down but i saw a lot of great things at the starwood I saw Motley Crue's very first show ever in public um, when they played, and they played at the Starwood, and uh, they were god awful. <laughs> but um, you know, but you could tell, like, just real quick on Motley Crue, you could tell that something was brewing. Yeah, it was just, it was actually like really, really lo-fi at that point, punk rock. Yeah. But it had this energy and this whole vibe about it was like, holy shit, something is happening. But um, and uh, ironically, uh, I got to see I, I'm kind of on this Rory Gallagher oh. kick again right now. Uh, yeah, I got yeah. to see. That's a I great got kick. To see, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, and I got to see Rory at the um, Starwood in oh, 70, really? 77. Oof. So, uh, yeah, I mean. Me and my guitar player, Phil Sandoval from Arbor Saint. Yeah. Uh, him and I went on a Sunday night. Probably tickets were three bucks, man. And it was like, we were front row. And and I had only known Rory from Guitar Player Magazine. I wasn't of really course. that, you know, I was kind of getting into music, but I wasn't really that familiar with him. And, but just completely blown away yeah. at that point. So, you know, that was when I first started going to see shows and seeing bands like from Los Angeles playing in clubs. And it kind of made me feel like, wow, there's like a scene here. You know, I only know my exposure to music was from Circus Magazine, Hit Parader Magazine, Rolling Stone or whatever. And it was all the big bands, you know, Zeppelin, Sabbath, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the big bands. And it's like, well, that's beyond. I think that's a world that it's just untouchable, you know. But when you start seeing these bands and, and the musicianship is like incredible and, and say, like, wait, these guys are from my area and they're playing the clubs. That's when you start to realize there's a local scene. And so that's when I started to sort of, we all started getting into the local scene. So, you know, by virtue of where we were from, you know, of course we started getting into music and, you know, begin to play instruments and then we started to go out more. And yeah, yeah. next thing you know, we're forming a band. So in the beginning of Armored Saint, you know, we started playing these places. And so that's when, so you what know. Year, when was that? What year was that? Or would you remember the we're month? Yeah, we're talking, even, even the month yeah, or the summer or we're something? talking about 1982. Uh, we graduated high school in 1981. And uh, while we were in high school, um, we were still going to clubs and stuff, but we hadn't actually formed Armored Saint yet. Armored Saint formed in the summer of 1981, the year after we, over right. the summer we graduated. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, it was really at that point where Armored Saint formed, and it was, uh, I don't want to go too much into the history, it could be dry and long and boring, but, sure. <laughs> but it was formed by Gonzo Phil and Dave Pritchard. Uh, and they just began playing, the three of them, no bass, no singing. And next thing you know, John joined. And then I would occasionally join for jams. But at the time, I was playing in another group. I uh, was playing with a guy called Greg Leon. And Greg was kind of from the tail end of the Van Halen thing. So I was the young guy in the band. I was 17 playing with 22-year-olds right. and... So I was playing the Troubadour and the Whiskey already um, before I even graduated high school. So I was in this band, and i that was the reason why I wasn't joined. I didn't join Armored Saint at the get-go. But um, by the time spring of 1982 came around, uh, the guys, you know, reeled me in. We had been Armored Saint where we all grew up in the same neighborhood, and we've been childhood friends forever. Um, so when the band started, uh, that was that was the catalyst. We just we were just all best friends. And when I'm just really curious about what was the like the sort of availability of music or the influence of different bands or the people around you in the scene because I think even like ten years later we all had our scene here 
I mean, there was a group of about half a dozen very active people who sort of were the movers and shakers. And have you heard this record? And have you heard that record? So I'm always really curious, when is the moment where something big happened or like the first Maiden or what Priest was doing or where it kind of made a very definite impact on, OK, this is a big influence. We're going to move in this direction or, oh, shit, we just saw Metallica or we just saw whatever. And that kind yeah. of spurs you on a bit, like, you know, they're just like pivotal moments, you know. Yeah, I would have to say that it was, I mean, when we started getting into, uh, you know, heavier music as we were getting into, like, say, our senior year of high school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're talking 80, 1981 here, 80, 81. At that point, you know, yeah. uh, you know, first Maiden Records out, you know, and at this point, we used to c- congregate at this um, record shop in um, Pasadena called Pubaz. And Poobaz was the only place within a 25 mile radius that we knew about, at least, um, that sold export uh, export records from the UK. We were specifically interested in what was going on in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was and it was the only place you could find Kerrang magazine. Oh, so for, right. For a lot of yeah. for a lot of people, uh, that's where it was the Bible. It's where things. It's we were first introduced to Iron Maiden and. Um, Motorhead, Def Leppard, Saxon, you know, the New Ever British Heavy Metal was something that was completely new mm. to us and, and the rest of the world, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so, uh, you know, before that, we had, we were already into Judas Priest and Scorpions and UFO and Finn Lizzy and there's a Black Rose thing right there. Oh, wow, yeah. Water. But, you know, yeah. I, we were already <laughs> into that stuff. Um, but when the New Ever British Heavy Metal came out, it was kind of like this grassroots thing that made you sort of think like wow we could maybe do this too you know yeah yeah so poobah's this record shop was all about that connection with the new wave of british heavy metal it was the only place you can get Kerrang magazine it's the only place you could find imports you know so that's where we would go we would go there every saturday or sunday uh we would drive up to poobah's and you'd see five guys with long hair and leather jackets Looking yeah, yeah. through records, you know. I mean, it's the same experience probably for you and a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah, same, yeah. Ten years yeah, after. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's where it started. Um, that was the catalyst for like, wow, you know, we we should do this. We should do what we see in the magazines. We want to try to do that here. And do you remember the first kind so of When we first started, our whole goal whatever? was to make... Well, you know, we started playing clubs uh, and our whole thing was like, we need to make wherever we play look like the marquee. Like that was okay. what we wanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was our goal was to like, whatever, wherever we're playing, it has to be like the marquee. We wanted a whole row of nothing but headbangers in the front row. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, that's not, it was completely uncommon. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, at the at that point, you know, we started playing shows uh, at clubs and we were playing, you know, the usual suspects, the Troubadour and um, the Roxy um, and and other places in our neighborhood, which are not really known for having clubs like things are being put on in like uh, like temples, you know, like just these weird rooms that were yeah, yeah. makeshift venues, you know, um, and that's really where it started. Um, and, a lot, you know, mind you, I guess I should mention that we weren't the only ones doing this. Yeah. You know, um, Rat was doing this. Um, Wasp was doing this, speaking of yeah. Wasp. Black and Blue was doing this. Black and um, Blue, okay, yeah. A, a U.S. version of Overkill was doing this. Uh, Betsy Bitch was doing this. Of course, yeah. um, uh, You know, a lot of bands were doing this. And um, we were one of them and so as, as a result consequently we were doing gigs we played several shows with rat played several shows with wasp played several shows with a band called stormer um we played shows with bitch and overkill and yeah. black and blue um so it was just a sort of rotating thing you know even Dokken before Dokken even oh, right. got their major label they were they were in that scene i'm sure i know um, you about that before yeah <laughs> yeah so we were playing with with those guys. Uh, George Lynch used to be in a band called Exciter, and we did shows with Exciter. You know, so um, not the Canadian one, but the. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so 
it was during that time where you started to see like going back to your question about the beginning of it you know it was like i said it was really uncharted territory at the time um and in the beginning it wasn't like we wasn't like headbanger galore from the get-go yeah, yeah. it was a lot of people just sort of standing and watching and yeah. hollywood has this reputation for being like that because hollywood has seen everything like yeah, yeah. this city you know it's a little bit jaded in that way the same way that new york can be jaded you get it all you see you you know we have everything here jazz blues bluegrass funk you know r b it's all here so this place can tend to be a little jaded so in the beginning it was like crowds were sort of like just sort of looking and watching you know but again like we would our whole thing was we come from the suburbs and so we'd bring all our suburban friends with us yeah, yeah. we're also going to poobahs with us by the way yeah yeah We'd have a load of personal friends, yeah. 15, 20 of them showing showing up and like, okay, guys, marquee, it's on, yeah, yeah. you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so suddenly people were like, what the fuck is, what is going on? Like, are these guys, they, they, at first they thought we were punk rock because of the, the head banging and the sort yeah, yeah, of the yeah. energy and then the room. And it's like, no, it's not punk rock. This is, this is heavy metal, you know. So it was slow and gradual, but it. It was, you know, it's hard to like pinpoint one moment, but um, there was one maybe cusp moment that happened when we played the Troubadour. And the Troubadour used to be a sit down dining room uh, venue where you would go and you'd, they'd have cocktail tables yeah, yeah. and chair, chairs all the way up to the stage. And so you would order something to eat. You'd order some drinks, and then a band would play. You'd sit down. You know, it's one of those places. Yeah, yeah. It was like it was like that for years. And so, when we, I think the first time we played at the Troubadour, our friends were like, "We're not having this." So they came up and they moved all the tables and chairs back about twenty feet back. Yeah. And the club was all pissed off. Like, what are you guys doing? You can't do this. And they're like, "No, no, no. We don't give a shit what you say." And Next thing you know, it was a little bit like chaos happening. Yeah. We come on stage, they're going nuts, and then we're going nuts. So people in the audience are like, wow, what the fuck is happening here, you know? And since that day, as far as I know, maybe it was, maybe I'm wrong, but I had yet to see the tables back in that <laughs> venue since that yeah. day. So I think that, not that we were the start of it, I think that like bands like us and and, and ourselves – were the beginning of, of a sort of a change in the way, you know, uh, people were experiencing music in Los Angeles, you know. So it was a crazy time. Like, I kind of wish I paid attention more because I didn't, <laughs> I don't, you know, we were 19 years old at that point. So I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I think it was sort of like, you just sort of felt like, well, it's, it's supposed to be like this. Like, yeah, it's yeah. not anything. It's not anything special. It's just supposed to be like this. Yeah, you know? yeah. But hindsight's well, always twenty twenty, and you look back in time and you go, you know what? Something really cool started here. Yeah. And you you were here, and I, I'm not I, sure like that. Said, um, I'm not <laughs> sure that. I'm not sure that when you're at the mo at that moment in time where something is virgin territory, whether you understand that it's virgin territory, you know, that's a sort of naivety or the impetuosity of youth. That you're just sort of yeah. in the moment, you're not aware until a couple of years later, and you go, "Oh, fucking hell, that was a really cool yeah. moment," you know. It's true, and, and then, you know, people I get asked about this subject a lot. You know, what was it like? What was it like? You know, and I kind of like, I, it was cool. I mean, from what I remember, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all kind of happened so fast. It really did. Yeah, uh, and then, I mean, but it, but it must yeah. have just jumped really quick then to like getting signed and did oh, man. going on tour. Oh Even man. I remember the first time I went on tour, I was like, fucking hell, you're going to play in some of the venues you read about in magazines. It's a really, Oh, we could do this. You can, you can release a thing. And, you know, I mean, yeah. that must've been, must been crazy. Right. I mean, it was really fast, you know, um, quiet riot was the first band in, well, again, aside Van Halen, notwithstanding, you know, yeah. um, Quiet Riot was really the first band of that second sort of, I, don't know, I guess, of the heavy metal genre, you mm -hmm. could say. They were the first ones out of the gates. So they came out 
and got a record deal and it still seemed a little bit like surreal you know but that album was huge you know oh, yeah. and, and so um yeah people Next don't realize Mind, mental health is just enormous record like or... it's just, it was massive i mean it yeah. was so big i mean it, it, look i think granted it took probably I don't know. I'd have to do the research on it, but it had to have taken at least at least six months to a year before it really got million status. But yeah. still, still pretty quick. It's done like eight million in the USA or something. Yeah, and then and then it just went even bigger once MTV got a hold of the video and the yeah, bang your head was crazy. forget it mental health yeah. forget it. Uh, and but right behind them was Motley Crue. So Crue, uh, as you know, because you're you know your history, they. First time independent, so their their first record came out independently, which is kind of also sort of a old school kind of like a new wave of British heavy metal influence. Yeah, as well, like they were like, yeah. yeah, like they were like, we're gonna do it ourselves, you know. And kudos to them for doing that. It was a great move, and it was perfect. And that again, it fueled the scene to just perpetuate this new sort of wave. What was happening in the city. Um, but by the time, let's say, Armored Sane and Wasp and Rat, and Black and Blue, all those bands started playing live, uh, another six months behind Motley Crue, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it, it, again, the snowball was just gaining speed. And so, like, by the time we did our first gig with me and the band, it was 1982. And within 12 months of that time, we had already gotten to the place where we were selling out as a headliner, you know, uh, 800, a thousand cap, uh, uh, clubs. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, uh, not only us, but rat was doing the same. We used to do shows with rat and with Ross and we would do like two, three bands on a bill, but within six to eight months, we couldn't do that together because we could sell it out on our own. Right. So each each of us started headlining, and we were all doing well. And so within twelve months, we were we had a record deal by late by this by this winter of nineteen eighty three. We had a major label record label. We had even we hadn't even played fifty gigs yet. So yeah. that gives you an idea about how fast uh, things were happening in the city. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Rat got a deal as well. Same story for them. Within six to eight months, they had a deal. Wasp had a deal. Black and blue got a deal. You know, I mean, everybody was getting signed. It was just like, it was just, it was really kind of was too fast, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it was pretty crazy, you know. And again, at the time, like, that time just goes by so fast that you don't, you know, you don't realize that's like, what's really happening you just sort of think like well this is what should be happening, you know. <laughs> and then do you remember the first time you got like fucking you traveled to another city to play or you went to New York to play or the first time you were aware, like, Oh, you, we could actually, this is a viable option to try get in a van or in a bus and travel around and play. And then do you remember the, uh, after that, do you remember the first time landing in Europe to play? What was that? Well, yeah, that's a two sided question. Cause uh, you know, on one hand in the U S um, we, we had done the first time we went out of state was, was before we got signed. And we just did like two shows in Arizona, which is not, you know, it's only like a six to eight hour car drive. So it's yeah. not really like touring, but yeah. it, that was technically our first time out of playing out of the cut out of the state. And it wasn't, that wasn't enough of a taste to know what was to come. Cause that yeah, was, yeah. we booked some weird bar and we went there and no one knew who we were. And people were dancing and we were like, what the fuck? And we're wearing armor, and you know, like uh, we're, we're like <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're like an art, you know, we're a heavy metal band, and yeah, yeah. people are yelling out, you know, Freebird, and it was like, okay, this is yeah, weird. Yeah. But um, it wasn't until, uh, believe it or not, it wasn't until we got signed and our first record came out, March of the Saint. It came out in the spring, uh, early summer of nineteen eighty. Four, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was a fall, I can't remember. But it came out in '84, and that was the first time we ever went beyond and went on tour. And, uh, you know, this is like, again, this is, again, don't, we didn't really appreciate what we had because we were so young and naive. And 
again, didn't realize the reality of what was happening. <laughs> but um, our very first tour was a major tour. We opened for Quiet Riot on their Condition Critical Tour. And okay. the support, direct support was White Snake on Slide It In. This is before Slide It In really blew up. Wow. And we, we were third on the bill. And this was an arena tour. So, wow. you know, we're, we're just like, I, what are we doing here? But okay. Right. And our first, our first, I'd say. White Snake, White Snake in the middle. So, yeah, I guess this is like the John Sykes sort of. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Cozy Powell every night. Wow. Cozy Powell, John Sykes, Neil Murray. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was insane. I, and we knew enough about White Snake at that point to, and obviously David Coverdale and, uh, and Cozy, mm. we were well aware of their history. And just completely in awe of them every night. Um, but again, just like snotty nosed punk kids who didn't know or appreciate. Well, I think we appreciated it because that's just, we come from humble, you know, suburban place. And so we were very, you know, we were humble about that. Um, I just mean like, didn't really grasp yeah, the importance of it. <laughs> And so our first, uh, I'd say it was like a three, it was like a eight week tour. And I'd say like the first two to three weeks of it were spent in a, um, just a couple of cars, like a couple of sedans and a truck carrying our gear. So the first half of it was, you know, kind of roughing it, but we didn't know any better, didn't care, yeah. didn't matter. You yeah. know, we were just happy to be there. And then eventually, Halfway through, uh, I guess our record company, Chrysalis Records, footed the bill for a, a tour bus, and it was our first ever tour bus. And, you right. know, it was a cheap one, but it was still yeah. a tour bus. And we were just, like, in heaven at that point. So, you know, that was really our first experience of being out and about. And, again, um, first time playing any place besides California. So no one really knew who we were, but... It was a great experience for us to get out and to play for people. As far as I can remember, we did, we got good responses. It's not like, uh, you know, it was that again, the, the scene was so, it was such a beginning of the scene that, um, I think people were just happy to see bands that even looked or sounded like Judas Priest or yeah. Iron Maiden, yeah, which yeah. we kind of had an, you know, we had a bit yeah. of an influence of course, yeah. from those guys in the beginning. So it was like, yeah, these guys sound like Maiden, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so it's like they don't care it's like ah, we're in. we're in so it was a good experience for us it really really was we were great it's a, it's crazy to think of like white snakes being in the middle before i mean condition critical <laughs> i mean quite right are sort of on the way out by then but still yeah. arenas you know so what was the first yeah. time you get to london he must have um, freaked out when you first got to london and got to well yeah the, the yeah that was the second part of your question yeah. was playing in europe and so like as you as you can imagine uh, from what what i was saying earlier that we were heavily influenced i would say the majority of our influences coming from europe yeah. and so our dream was to not only make our gigs seem like they were at the marquee, but we <laughs> we wanted to go there. We wanted yeah, to yeah, play London. We wanted to play in Germany and then Holland, all over Europe. We just wanted to go there, you know. But we had a hard time getting there for quite a long time. It was part of our plight with our record company and with our management. And we were, again, we were 21 years old when our first record was released. Right. So we were, that was part of our conversation was we want to go to Europe. We want to go and play there. But, you know, we quickly found out that you don't always get what you ask for and you really have to be an asshole to get what you want sometimes. And so our company, record company and our management all said the same thing. Oh, you don't make any money going to Europe. Um we found out that we being an American signing, even though Chrysalis is originally based in London, okay, um, we were signed from the LA offices. Okay, so we're under different direction of A and R people there, and sort of there's this whole political thing that we were completely unaware of, obviously because we were we own right, punks. Right. 
<laughs> so the album was um, the album was the album just an import in Europe then, or was it actually? Well, I actually I do think that because of their uh, their uh, you know they obviously it's the same company. I think yeah. they had distribution worldwide. I, I don't think sure. it was that so much. I think yeah. it was more about you know because we were signed under the umbrella of the A and R department in in Los Angeles that it was like okay this is your deal you guys make it happen so you know it, it was all on the american company to make us you know okay. Ha- okay. start to happen so immediately it was like well no we're going to concentrate on the us you know we got, got we got we go for radio you know press and radio and you know try to get you on the road and like, okay yeah, yeah. that's that's all fine and good but like like we i think we have like a fall like we we're all about tape trading at that point so i'm like Dude, we're getting write ups in Kerrang. We're getting write ups in, like, yeah. you know, like we have a presence there. So let's go. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. again, it was this thing about the bottom line and like the money. And I was like, okay, well, maybe next album. Okay. So then yeah. next thing you know, Delirious Nomad comes out in 1985. Same conversation. Oh, no, you're not going to make any money there. Yeah. yeah and there's no, and, there's, kind of, there's kind of no way to be sort of proactive yourself. Uh, it, crossing the Atlantic as you could be in the you know in the nineties. Now you can, it's not like I think it's open to just go. You would walk into a travel agent and go, "Hey, how much does that cost?" Right, and then just like you call somebody in Europe and go put it together. I mean, it, it could work like that. You've got. Yeah. I feel since so many barriers put in your way to kind of not take. You're convinced yeah. these people know better. I guess I don't know. That's that true. I mean. It, it really was like that, and you know, and I talked about this before. We were. It really goes again. It goes to how naive we really were. Yeah. Uh, about the business, and I find out much later uh, in life that you really need to. You can have a manager, but you still need to manage yourself to some degree. Yeah. So, and that's something we never did for a long time. We just yeah. felt like, like, like you just said, like, well, we have a manager. That's their job, you know. Yeah. But, and, but and, I found out much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just found out much later that like you can't have that attitude. You really have to be, to some degree, DIY has to be in your DNA yeah. at some point, at some level, for the rest yeah. of your life. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the that's the thing is, I guess when bands like ourselves came along in the '90s, everything was kind of downsized to a degree. But you we were the same tape trading thing. But you were there was more of a kind of the idea of having a manager seemed very very far fetched. But yeah. and even now, like even the other week, I had to remind you think to somebody like, hey, you do actually work for us. And although you may think this yeah. is a bad idea, this is what we want to do. Um, yeah. I guess in the 80s, because things are, hmm, I think maybe there was just maybe more trust in these, in expertise, because that's just what's handed down to you. And like you said, you can't really walk into a, it's not like you're able to look up flights online and go, hey, we could do this ourselves. Or Yeah. Well, you know, here's a good example maybe of the difference uh, of sort of philosophy. You know, we had signed to a major label, as did a lot of bands uh, from L.A. Mm. Uh, Metallica, on the other hand, said, fuck you, L.A., and they went to San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And then so they said, well, we're going to put out our own record. So, so they put out their own record, and they signed with an independent label, as yeah, everyone yeah. knows. And then they said we're going to go to Europe, and they their first tour to Europe was sleeping on floors of friends' houses, and yeah, they drove yeah. in vans, and they didn't make any money, and they they got a lot of favors from people they knew in the press. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Lars had some connection because he was European, but yeah, yeah, and that just goes to prove you can do it. You can do it. They did it. A lot I, of fans. I wonder at if that I, level I, I did it. I but we were on the major label and like, oh, well, yeah, major yeah, yeah. label. No, 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 you can't do that. You know? <laughs> yeah, I guess the major labels were still enthralled to this whole getting as big as possible sort of rock star, rock, whole rock scene, whereas Metallica was kind of against yeah. that, kind of like doing it their own way. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's mm-hmm. set up the next one because we're about to run out of time here. So okay, let's... sure. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. But yeah, that's. I think that's really fascinating because it sort of indicates to me that there's a sort of, there's an element of that still that 70s, 80s idea where everything was about to be as big as possible, blown up as possible. And you're getting sort of advice going, no, no, wait, 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 wait. You guys are going to be selling a million records, this, that, and the other. Whereas the kind of more extreme, you know, maybe underground, um, you know, the more thrash 
I don't know, maybe vibe is to kind of go, look, we're never going to be that big. Let's just do it under different definitions. I don't know if that's maybe an overreach of a, an observation. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty accurate, you know. I mean, again, like being this maybe one of the downfalls being in a city like Los Angeles where the entertainment industry is just like massive. Of course. Like, of course. Yeah, I mean, so you, you have this sort of aura of like, you know, this is the way things are done and you do them by the book and we're going to spend buckets of money and we'll see what happens, you know. Yeah. So, but, so, so considering all that, like when it, did it, t- I mean, was it within an 87 or 88 then because, or. Oh yeah. So first time getting here, I like, so it, it, it was a, you know, it was, <laughs> it was an uphill battle as you can imagine. Yeah. And it really wasn't until we were dropped from Chrysalis. So it was, you know, our contract ended with them after we made Raising Fear Right, yeah, 19, yeah, yeah. 1988 or so. Okay. And right. then um, it was during that period between 88 and uh, whatever, 90, 89, that we got an offer to play at the Dynamo Festival yeah, in that's Holland. What I was, that's what I was going to say, because that's what the first time I would have seen the logo and associated it when I would have read Kerrang! or something and gone like, oh, shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, de- I de- honestly can't recall the the, how that procedure happened like who reached out to us or anything like that but um we got an offer to play dynamo and it was like oh we know what dynamo is and so i think it was only their third one maybe i can't remember but it was early in their career but uh so of course we said well hell yeah let's go to europe you know and um we also had a club show at the Dynamo Club, I believe it was called the Dynamo Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a was the one with the pentagram on the floor and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we went there and played two shows in Holland, and man, it was like what a welcome! Like we, uh, I mean, after waiting for so long, you know, so uh, I think I've, at I've, that I've, point I've, it was six, six, eight years or something. The bill is the bill correct? And am I correct? And I'm looking. Sorry, I, I was looking down here at the bill. Um, Exodus, Laz Rocket, Candlemas, Toxic, Sabbat, Paradox, and you guys. Is that the bill, or am I? Um, no, I think it was. I think Sabotage headlined that. Hey. And and Sacred Reich was also on that bill. Um, I wonder is that. Band- a band called. Oh, here um, you go. Okay, no, it's the, 19, it's nineteen eighty nine. It says here eighty nine. Okay, so it's a little okay. That sounds about right. Eighty nine. Yeah, you've got okay. Holy Moses, Sleaze Bees, Sleaze Bees, Sacred Reich, Armored Saint, and Sabotage. Wow. Forbidden was on that. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I forgot yeah, yeah. about that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. And so that was yeah. the first time. Wow. So that must have been. God, that's a long was, time going to get to get there for the first time. Five, six years. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was awesome though. Uh, it was like we were just again just in heaven. Just it, you know, it just it just everything about the environment just reeked to Europe, and it was like, oh, this is what we've been waiting for. And and a big thing for at least I remember on the uh, on the TV at the time. I mean, my first probably exposure, I suppose, was maybe there was a show called Sky Monsters of Rock, which must have been. I don't know, 86, 87 or 88 would have been the video for Madhouse or something. You know, that was a kind of had a sort of quite the impact because the records were a bit, well, I mean, they were co- relatively hard to get here except for the first release. Um, yeah. But that was the so that was a big impact. And I think an awful lot of headbangers saw that and went, well, we have to see this band. I mean, how, what, when is that going to be possible kind of thing, you know? Yeah. But remember about yeah. that video because it's, it's, I don't know if any, for people who haven't seen it, go and check it out. It's a fucking killer video, you know? That's the live one you're talking yeah, about, yeah. right? In Detroit yeah. or Cleveland or something or something. Uh, yeah, it was from Cleveland. It was from a tour. It was during our last tour with Chrysalis. Uh, we were on the yeah. Raising Fear tour. And we did a tour with uh, with Halloween and Grim Reaper. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was a great tour, actually. But, that, but that, video, uh, that video used to get played a lot on this show. So for a kind of generation of for my cool. generation, that would have been the first thing that we saw. Or, wow. Or, we saw like introduction to the band live. So that was quite the, uh, I mean, it made yeah. quite a sort of impact on quite a lot of people. Yeah. I think, That's you know? great. Yeah. And then, you know, so that was that show in 89 in, in Holland was our first mm. time setting feet on the ground, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then um, we finally did get to the marquee and um, okay. um, 
symbol of salvation came out, but it was okay. again it, it was the it was the new marquee, not not uh, the yeah, OG yeah, yeah. one because they yeah, had yeah. moved, right? I forget yeah, what yeah. year then, but uh, but we were like doesn't matter, we're still at the marquee, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was amazing too. It was a packed house and it was a great show and yeah, really really hot in there. That I think it was during the summer, so it was blazing hot inside, but. Um, and what was the first then kind of do you remember the first full European tour that took you around and for a couple of weeks or did it was that the early 90s then we're moving into well, symbols, we're moving into symbol of salvation era yeah know? yeah so we didn't actually we did some dates on that symbol tour uh in 90 well I guess it would have been 91 yeah, 1991 yeah. uh and that was really the first time we did any kind of touring um and it wasn't really even a full tour. Um, we did a, a string of dates. I believe they were the Rock Hard Festival um, oh, sponsored yeah. uh, shows. So there was one was one in Berlin and one in um, was it actually East Berlin, which was crazy. Oh, really? Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it was just after the wall had come down. Um, and then we played, uh, oh, I can't remember the other cities, but... There was a series of German festivals, and Dusseldorf. they were all sponsored by Rocker. Yeah, Düsseldorf, yeah. Oberhausen. I don't know. Yeah, of course, I don't. Yeah. I don't know if they. I don't. I still don't know if they had done the Gilsenkirchen one yet. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think it was you know four or five shows in in Germany, and um, those were good too. But uh, the headliner on those was Creator, I think. Okay. And um, I think there was a lot of times. Uh, people didn't know what to make of us, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know. You were sort of we straddling had... a couple of different things that I think it probably people were more, um, probably more open to that a couple of years later when main th when yeah. heavy metal made a bit of a return 96, 97, 98, 91 yeah. was pretty yeah. much thrash metal time. And if you're playing with Creator, they don't yeah. want to hear, no, yeah, and then you know. No. And, that, and that we had like, race. yeah, <laughs> at that point we had like, we, in the beginning, yeah. we kind of got lumped into the thrash scene and the, during the mid eighties, yeah. but by the time 91, 90, came around, we had, we got rid of our armor and our yeah. sound kind of, of got a little more sort of rock, rock. Well, that's the symbol of, salva that's symbol of salvation of, I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of my very favorites. Like it's, it's yeah. where everything sort of. Um, I think coalesced in a sort of really, really strong way. You've just mm. sort of the production, the choruses. I mean, it's just super memorable mm. from start to finish. But it's just mm. sort of like intelligent heavy metal in that sense. But it still has mm. the ass kicking part of it. Like yeah, the culmination of the previous couple of records. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was the that those string of dates uh, was about it. Was about it. And and then we did. We also did a week with the Scorpions. Okay. In this in December of like ninety one, right? I'm gonna say, and and that was a super last minute. Like we at that point we had re-signed with Q Prime Management, so we were with Q okay. Prime again. Oh, Q Prime. And, okay, yeah, yeah. And um, they also managed Tesla. Oh and wow! So, yeah, I'm big big Tesla fan. Yeah, I love Tesla. Yeah. So Tesla was on the tour with Scorpions. Something happened with their passports or something, and they they couldn't go. Okay. So there was about seven or eight shows in December and they called us and said, we just had them cancel. Can you guys get on a plane? Like in, in 10 days or something, we're like, what? Yeah, wow. we'll be sure. It's so great. we went and played these shows with Scorpions, big arenas. It was, you know, it was during the, um, what's the big, um, the hit they had, uh, with the whistling, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah whatever was, whatever record that was, it was a, a huge song, record. A song that shall not be named. Yeah, I know. Yes, yeah. yes, we shall not bring bring up that name again. So the Jay. shows were to the magic of the moment. Blah blah. blah. Anyway, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> but the only problem was that Tesla was still on the billing. Okay. So we'd we'd come out to play. People are expecting, you know, little Susie's on the up, and yeah, yeah. here we come out like what. Yeah. Who are these guys, you know? So it was a little weird, but whatever. It was fine. And, it, it was and that always, was it. Yeah. That was it until 2000, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird because it's um, it seemed to me that um, the band sort of dissolved a couple of years then before Heavy Metal started to kick back, which was about 96, 97, you know? 
and that um, probably coming over to play, I could imagine. I first time I went to Dynamo was ninety seven, and then mm. um, ninety eight. I think was the first time you had there was a tent with like Saxon Eister at Blind Guardian and Hammerfall was on the main stage. And people don't really realize, but Hammerfall, Glory to the Brave, as goofy as it was, it brought old school heavy metal kind of back to a whole generation of people who hadn't really paid attention to it. And that, mm. I would imagine, would have been the right moment. But that's only two, three years before then we go to 2000, you know? Um, yeah. Obviously, obviously after, uh, you know, Symbol Dave died and all that stuff. Yeah. And then the band just kind of, you just put it on ice or what 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 happened really well yeah i mean the, well the biggest the biggest sort of caveat was that uh you know at the end of symbol we were sort of at wits end a little bit internally yeah. like what you know the tide at least in america the tide was changing with grunge and everything of course yeah yeah so for us it was like oh my god like 10 years we've been doing this still ha still having a hard time getting to europe a re we made a great record got great yeah. reviews and everything but it's like no one's really it's kind of going over heads and it's not doing yeah, much yeah I could, um, see, I could see how that would be starting to begin in 91 92 yeah the music and scene so is getting then, more extreme death metals coming in and thrash metal and yeah they went underground and then death metals kind of surged started the surge and stuff yeah. like that and then john got the call from anthrax so okay then that of was course, yeah, yeah. That, that that was the sort of straw that broke the camel's back as they say yeah, yeah. And it was it was almost like we kind of all said okay enough like we need to john has to go do this and yeah we all, i gave him my blessing we all gave him our blessing and then time for us to take a break we didn't know if it was going to be forever or not we just mm. said let's it, this we need it it needs something needs to give and this is it we didn't think twice about replacing John either, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just time to move on. So uh, that's what we did. And, um, and that's when I got involved with Fate's Warning and of course, started yeah, doing yeah, other of things. Course. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, Fate's Warning. But, uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, then, like, then, like, in, by the late 90s, um, you know, metal started coming back again and being, like, a cool thing. And yeah. the genre embraced... Uh, lots of different styles of music and that's when you know uh crossovers started to happen more frequently and yeah. new metal <laughs> came out and yeah. then you know uh I, metal I don't think, I, a few years later i don't think even people really realize that like 25 years ago that era of 98 97 like the sort of some of the dogma or some of the boundaries that were there and i'm not really talking about you know new metal or that kind of stuff but up people started to go, hey, we could do our own festival, a small underground one to 1,000, 2,000 people. The sort of boutique festival came back. The kind of second or third wave of black and do metal came around. But this yeah. time people were going, you know what, we we like Hawkwind, we want to hear, you know, there's a really strange billings began to be form, form in the 2000s. And I think that that laid the groundwork for, I don't know, I mean, I was going to say to you, like, do you think that the sort of the shelving for a couple of years was essential maybe to the kind of second wind that the band got then in the 2000s because you got to be able to have a bit of a break from it and come back and go actually you know all bets are off now we're gonna um yeah. there's less pressure to have to make it in this sort of big kind of mainstream way or something i don't know absolutely absolutely you know i mean you you hit it on the hit it on the button there like that that was that was a philosophy we were taking it was like you know we did that. We did that ten years of think. You know, major label. It's gonna be this yeah, way, yeah. and with major managers and major yeah, this, yeah. and and then it was like, you know what? None of that. It didn't work for us. We're we're a we're like our like our favorite bands. We're a grassroots band. You know, we that's that's what we should have been from day one, and mm. what we wanted to be. But you know, maybe our decisions took us to other areas. And so once once we saw the once the resurgence came up. You know, thankfully for us, it was like, you know, like you said, like, like the first Bang Your Head festival we played. Oh, yeah. Was, you know, um, and that was a festival that, like you said, was kind of bridging a bunch of gaps, you know, and yeah, yeah. had a lot of old, old bands on the bill, but also a lot of cool new bands on the bill. And yeah. we were, you know, we were sort of becoming an old band at that point, but middle aged. To be, yeah, middle aged band, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but those kind of festivals were, were genius for us because it was like, oh, you know, like, where were you? And we're, you know, it, it was just a matter of the planets aligning, really, is what yeah, it yeah, was. Yeah. 
and did so you, did you find yeah, there was a certain, did you find there was a certain kind of pressure off that you could actually kind of enjoy it more or something you know absolutely absolutely and you know i have to say like that that um realization was becoming really apparent when we first got back together to do revelation uh, mm. we made the rec yeah, we yeah. made the record in 99 but we did we didn't really start doing much touring until 2000 yeah. so uh, it was in that time in 2000 2001 we actually did a proper U uh, european tour with brainstorm oh and, okay. um, yeah, brainstorm yeah yeah and it was like our first time in a bus in europe and like actually wow. doing tour dates playing clubs and that's crazy isn't um, it? like almost 20 yeah. years after starting yeah the first tour. totally totally and it was like you know what like we just sort of when we got back together to make revelation um john technically was still in anthrax so we sort of had a handshake deal with all five guys in armored saint we said look we're going to do this we're going out with this philosophy the way that we started when we were 19 years old. We love playing together. We want to make music. And it's just for the love of music. We really didn't care enough about the business to give mm. a shit about making it. You know, it was more course, like yeah, yeah. our love was just in that sweaty 12 by 12 room, rocking out, pretending we're Iron Maiden or Judas Priest. That's our, that's yeah. the love we're after. So we're going to, we're going to do the same thing from this day forward. We're not going to fight with, you know, Management. trying to sell. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to try to sell more records. We're not going to try to get on the radio. We're not going to try to yeah, yeah. make an effort to do all this stuff. Um, now, thankfully, I have to say in the same breath that we've been given this opportunity with our, with Brian Slagle and with, with Metal Blade Records yeah. to allow us to work in that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I think, you know, a lot of labels, even independent labels, they have a bottom line. They, you know, they don't want to yeah. lose money. They want to they want to sell records. They want it to go in a progressive direction. Yeah. Well, Metal Blade um, is one of the last independents of all those, you know, bigger, older labels with a kind of different philosophy on that. And I think it's per yeah. kind of for Armored Saint to dip in and out of it when you, you know, when you want. And I think what what what's widely acknowledged and respected, at least in the, in the kind of modern sort of metal scene is uh, kind of some of the old bands or middle-aged bands, they reappear <laughs> and everybody goes, uh, either there's not the original members or they, or they start to drop off. But you guys all kept the same people. If you sold you in 2002, it's then 2012, 2022. But the shape, yeah. that, the, but the shape that the band was in was always incredibly striking, especially to all the, you know, the fans from the 80s and 90s who wouldn't have seen the band but our German fans or Central European fans is like, wow, yeah, I mean, John is still killing it. And that the whole band sounds really energetic, which I think really stood as, as a very important, um, just really stood to you guys when you came back, because people who perhaps were kind of going, oh, wow, fucking hell, Armored Saints band, I wonder what this is going to be like, were then, uh, you know, kind of blown away. And I'm not, you know, just saying that because, but I, that's what happened to me exactly when I saw you in the 2000s. It was like, fucking hell, they're in good shape. You know, mm. and it didn't then wane or deteriorate, or then oh, there's two guys missing, or you know, I think that's mm. an important kind of uh, strength in a way. You know. Yeah, I mean, you bring a good point because th this is something that we it's, it's very important for us. You know, I think the fact that we have known I've known John and Gonzo since we were in the second grade, so seven years old, eight years mm. old. Wow. So we've known each other quite a long time, and. We've always had this sort of fam familial family vibe about us, mm -hmm. and it's really important for us to keep that, you know. And I don't think that we'd ever, if, you know, if John never came back from Anthrax, we wouldn't be sitting here right now because we yeah. would never have just tried to continue the name Armored Saint when, mm -hmm. unless it's all of us together, you know. And, you know, losing Dave was a big blow to us. And, when he passed away from leukemia in 1991. Mm. Um, that was probably the only time in our entire career we had to sort of reevaluate where our goals were. And if we're going to go, we're going to go, but we're going to stay, we're going to keep this tight, you know? Yeah. And Jeff Duncan came into the fold. And yeah. and since then, we've had the same lineup, like, as you mentioned, that's very important for us. And um, also keeping ourselves from being too, like, you know, 
too old, you know, like yeah, yeah. we've tried it. We try to stay healthy. We try to, we don't want to be like going out there and faking it yeah, yeah. just, just to get a ticket by or people to buy our merch. You know, yeah. we, well, I mean, I we think would that, never, I think, would never do that. I think that resonates with people. Like, you know, I, if you see you guys at rock hard or something like that, I mean, it's something that kind of resonates with the newer generation of, um younger metal fans who are really looking for something authentic or that isn't contrived because that's mm. pushed at them constantly which is something yeah. they managed to maintain and also the standard of the records you know as well yeah. you know yeah yeah i think that's even harder to do nowadays with social media and the the image of uh what people view as what what thing what is beautiful or not let's say yeah um is really uh, a lot of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot of bullshit out there. But there's, but but if you can cut through the bullshit, there's X amount yeah. of people now who resonate much more with that. Yeah. You know, that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I've always felt that, you know, even before social media, like I, I always felt that people are smarter than you give them credit for, you know, like mm. I think that, you know, you can't go out and f fake it. You just, people yeah. know right away. Like if, well, you're, if you're not real. Yeah, I think it's one of the first conversations we were having and I was trying to sort of, you know, slag you. And I was like, oh, you know, you should bring out all the armor next time. For the shows. <laughs> and I think that sometimes I remember having this conversation with Tim from Sirithungal online. You know, when I first heard they were coming back together, my first sentence was, can you still sing like that? And he was like, yeah. And I said, dude, don't dress up like 1981. Don't be <laughs> the guy who's trying to sort of grab on. You know, like I said, don't, you know, don't wear Affliction t-shirt clothing and all the fucking or right. kind of like, don't dress up the other way either. Like, right, right, right. You know, be respectful of the past, but kind of not be tethered to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it really, you're just saying like, just be authentic and be who you are and be real. But, you know, keep in mind, you know, keep a little bit in mind where you, you come from, but, yeah, yeah. but you know. Yeah. <laughs> and grow old with a little bit some grace as well. But so, yeah. so how was it to play the opening few notes on the base of evil then, you know? With <laughs> well yeah that was pretty surreal yeah uh, how did that yeah, happen? I, uh well how did it happen well um i was on tour with uh with uh with faith's warning and yeah, yeah. um i was going through texas and um uh brian slagle was traveling and he said hey i'm gonna be in texas and i'm gonna bring king diamond with me he lives in he lives in Texas and he yeah, wants to yeah. come to the show. And I said, great. And then he kind of whispered in my ear on the phone, like, he's going to ask you something. I'm like, okay. Right. I'm like, what? What's going on? You know, and I, I started to get wind about uh, what was going on with Timmy. Um, but as far as I knew, he was still he was doing okay and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I kind, kind of had a hint as to why he was going to talk to me, but I still didn't know exactly. So comes backstage and, you know, I've, I've known King for a while, uh, never spent a whole lot of time with him, but we did it, Armored Saint uh, opened for King Diamond uh, solo in 89. Wow, okay. In the, U in the U.S., we did about three weeks with them. Okay. So, you know, we crossed paths, same label and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he pulled me aside, you know, and started to tell me about what was going on with Timmy and that... Uh, he was okay and everything was going well, but he wasn't sure if he was physically going to be up for a tour they had that summer. So this was the summer of 20. Okay. And you can see where this is going. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was flabbergasted, first of all. Like, yeah. like did you, do you mean like play with Merciful Fate, like in yeah, festival yeah. in Europe? And I'm like, holy shit. Um, so... I so I can I call, call you tomorrow and so we talked the next day I'm like I'm in I mean I mean I was free you know I, I didn't have anything going on yeah and uh, it was like of course I mean be like a crazy weird dream happening coming true sort of you know how soon and after so, saying yes did you put on evil and go oh, I could just imagine <laughs> <laughs> well it was pretty surreal uh, yeah. because I. I, I said yes, and then I, 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 at the back of my mind, I thought like, well, this isn't going to happen. They're using me as like, uh, I'm going to be in the batter's in the uh, pitch, you know, in the batter's box. Like, I'm not going to go to bat. I'm just going to be just in case, you know. Okay, okay. So yeah, I, yeah. I really, honestly, I didn't take it that serious. I thought, 
yeah, yeah. he's going to be all right. He's going to be all right. And then unfortunately, it wasn't that long. It was maybe six months later, we all got the news and we got yeah. Hank or, or King called me and told me what happened with Tim. And I was like, oh my God, it was just devastating. Mm. Number one, yeah, yeah. it was a horrible thing. I didn't want to hear. No one wanted to hear it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It was the worst thing that could have happened. And it wasn't until like I hung up the phone that it started to really sink in. Like, uh, dude, you need to start learning these songs. Because yeah, yeah. up until that point, I hadn't learned a lick. I hadn't. I sort of uh, remotely was listening to like, you know, oh yeah, kind of getting familiar with like the song, the records again. You know, this yeah, is yeah. great. You know, but it was like, dude, you have homework to do. Holy shit! That's when it became real. So I, I put on headphones and I made a list. Yeah, yeah. Very methodical about it. And it was during figuring out. I try. I think I picked an easy song. Like probably was evil because evil is one of the easier songs to play. Yeah. It's one of the shorter and easier ones. It probably was that song actually. Yeah. And once I started playing those first notes, I was like, God, "Is this really going to happen?" Yeah, it yeah. was nuts. So I started to have all these memories flooding back to me, and I, I should probably real quick. Yeah. When I first joined Armored Saint, nineteen eighty-two. We were, like I said, we were all about Kerrang! magazine. I started getting into tape trading and I got these pen pals, ironically, in Holland. Of course, we ended up in Holland mm. ten, eight, eight years later. Um, and I started tape trading with, with a friend in Holland and in Belgium and um, became, you know, old school, writing letters, pen to paper, people. Of course, like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, and so. We would we start trading tapes, and this is when the first time I was introduced to a lot of underground bands like like Girl and like um, like uh, like Holocaust and like crazy oh, right. bands that I never heard of, being from LA. And another one of the cassettes I got was Merciful Fate first EP, oh, which eventually no became yeah. yeah became Nuns Have No Fun, and it was on one side of a cassette, and. I, it was like the weirdest thing I had heard. It was like, you know, yeah. Blue Oyster Cult on 11 with like Alice Cooper. Like, I didn't know what to make of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the singing was like, I could only attribute it to like early priest, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, some Deep Purple in there because they were kind of progressive back For then. For sure, you yeah, know? yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the EP is great. Yeah. So I played the shit out of this EP. Like, I just wore that cassette out, yeah. you know. So all these memories started coming back when I was learning this, learning these songs, like, and I was just this little kid again, like excited about music again. You know, it was yeah, yeah. kind of weird. It was really weird. So I, it was just great, you know, and then fast forward to like, you know, going to Copenhagen for pre-production and just like, oh my Lord, <laughs> it's surreal, like yeah, yeah. It's crazy what's happening. And then that first show we played, uh, uh, we actually opened for Bowl Beat. It was our okay. first show. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I'm on these stairs. You know, we had these crazy like I know, I saw it. The, I saw yeah, it you saw the show. <laughs> <laughs> and awesome. I'm on the stairs and I'm looking to my left and there's freaking Hank Sherman's over there. Like, and then there's King and he's walking towards me and he's like in full makeup. And it's, dude, yeah. like, talk about hairs on your arm, like, rising, yeah. you know, just... Yeah, yeah. It was so surreal, so surreal. So I, uh, you know, it was so, it was a really fun tour that last, it was last summer that this happened. And, you know, halfway through the tour, it took me, it took me a good, you know, four to six shows to really get my legs on. Actually, not just me, but the whole band mm. to get our legs and to work out bugs and to feel comfortable on stage yeah, yeah. and with the music and, I found out very quickly that the music's not very easy to play and re to remember. There's a yeah. lot of parts. Yeah, yeah. It's very involved. Yeah, it's yeah. Not like going out and jamming ACDC tunes. I mean, it's, no. there's so much going on. Uh, so it took us a little while to get our legs. And about halfway, eh, maybe a third of the way through the tour, I, I started to make force myself to like take moments when you're out there to like open your eyes because a lot of times you just get insular and I'm. I get uh, closed in my own world and I, I want to yeah, yeah. play the parts right. And I'm yeah, yeah. very, you know, so I made it 
I made it a, an effort to like take a moment during songs or in between songs to just open your eyes and look where you are, like just soak it in. Yeah. So I started seeing like sunsets all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> amongst the sea of people and all these weird sort of simple memories yeah, yeah. Uh, started to get etched in my mind about, and really, for lack of a better thing, like stopping the smell of roses, you know, like just really exactly. just absorb what's happening because, yeah. you know, someone's going to ask you about it later and you're going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> it went by too fast, you know. Yeah, and that's that. That comes as kind of neatly brings us back to the beginning because that's the sort of, you know, they say youth is kind of wasted on the young or something. But the hindsight, True. you kind of just take a moment. Definitely, like I am. Um, even these last couple of years of playing some festivals every now and again, yet yeah, to take that moment to just, you know, soak it all in and go, okay, this one's in the middle. Yeah. I think I'm going to keep this yeah. one on board. You know, maybe you did yeah. when you were sixteen yeah. 16 or eighteen. You know, I, I mean, it kind of goes to what I was saying earlier about. You know, what was it like being in L.A. in 1983? You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I just, I was drinking and smoking pot and I'd go on stage high and then like, I don't know. I don't remember. It was fun. Yeah. But like, that's, that's why we, I was asking you those things when we met, we met the first <laughs> time. And that was my hope for at least in doing like an interview like this, because this is some form of a document for the people who will watch it, who go, who, you know, people who would just love to go back in time a little bit to take a little. Um, yeah. Moment in. I mean, uh, you know, it's. Um, I think it's some form of digital posterity or something like this. You know, which is sort yeah. of important because, especially, yeah. if it's like a twenty-five-year-old super armored saint fan who's looking forward to the next, you know, bang your head or rock hard magazine or festival, and they're just yeah. like they get a, a real nice little look into how yeah. it came together. You know. Yeah, and they and I I hope people you know. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, not to not to be like a preachy or anything like that, but like I hope people sort of take heed on that and like take a moment to, to look around you and appreciate where you are and mm. uh, embrace everything that's going on. You know, even if it's unsavory, you know, like just it's a cool. I don't know. We learn a lot from it. I mean, again, like hindsight's always twenty twenty. You know, yeah. like what you said is true. Like. <laughs> The youth is wasted on the young. Like, yeah, I would, I would do a lot of things different if I could go back. But you know what? There's a lot of things I just would not change. You know, yeah. so um, it, it, there's something cool about being naive, and and I, I also see that side of it as well. Yeah. I think you have so, to embrace that kind of thing completely because it just sort yeah. of, it's the because that early heavy metal scene because it it is sort of tethered to the impetuosity of youth and that youthful energy and a certain naivety. That's part of what the charm that drove it in the first place. And I think that it's it, now a day, sometimes there's too much second people second guessing their impulses because that's what modern social media has made it too mentally distracting mm. to follow an impulse in a, in a way. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's, that's the beauty of early heavy metal, you know? Um, Absolutely. And that's what I was trying yeah, and, to sort of dig to your brain to try and yeah. extract some of that, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I can honestly say that, you know, while while those years were happening, um, you know, it was there were moments when I would just sort of look, stand around, and look back and look around the around the room or look at a venue or the people mm. I'm with or whatever on stage or off stage or whatever, and just say, "This is." something really cool is happening right now this is a great this is a great moment something is happening and it's a good thing and i'm going to remember this for the rest of my life you know so yeah i try to do that all the time i still i mean it's one of those little things that you and maybe those that's a little lesson i took with me and yeah, yeah. made me uh, take a deep breath on a mercy on the merciful fate stage midway through that tour it was like remember when you were young you like you know yeah. Stop and smell the roses. Look around you. This is a cool thing. Something's happening right now. Yeah, take a little Don't... moment for it. You know, like a time of grace to just go. All right. Yeah, exactly. I... So I I try to appreciate uh, all that stuff. You know, hey, again, like I'm human. Like, there's plenty of times where I probably didn't pay enough attention. And ah, of course, what are you gonna do? You gotta learn. <laughs> there you go. On that note, I think that's a good moment to uh, stop. Awesome. All right. Oh! Great. That's Thank fair. you so much, sir. Yeah, man, it's uh, that's totally awesome. It's just, I just what I wanted to do to try and just sort of go back and have a little look and uh, and end. It's a perfect way to end with, you know, uh, a kind of little bit 
of introspection about how things are now and stuff you know cool cool yeah it's been uh it's been good and i i been kind of been talking about this a lot lately because of a 40 year anniversary tour we just did with wasp for instance yeah yeah and so that's sort of been the topic of this con- of conversation you know like well 40 years ago what was it like 40 years ago yeah, you yeah. know and my first answer is fuck i can't fucking remember that far back <laughs> But, so but it's also cool. It's also it's also cool to have to make defining memories. Now, often people say that yeah. to me. Oh, well, you know, how was it in '96 or '95 or '94? And you go, well, you know what? It, it was fine. But I think I like now, or well, you know, five years ago, whatever, better than maybe yeah. sometimes because you know you're you have a bit of a, a small little bit of wisdom and age, and you can just sort of take a little breath and enjoy things a bit more. You know? Ish. Yeah, I I know. I think I agree with that. You know, because like. Uh, like I said, you know, we were so young and naive at when things were starting out. Um, and so many things felt out of our control. You know, your yeah, life yeah, yeah. is yeah, sort yeah. of, su- there were times where I felt like it was spinning uncontrollably away from you. Yeah, yeah. And I do like, I do like being where I am now. I, like you said, there, you were a little bit smarter and you can, you can still, you know, yeah, <laughs> this much talent. Yeah. Um, you can, you can I'm manage. not sure about that. Sometimes I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think I'm able to appreciate things more because I'm more uh, at ease with a lot of things that, you know, there's not so many things out of grasp or out of control. Yeah, yeah. Things, are, things are a little more in control, relatively speaking. I mean, you know. Relatively. Um, but yeah, relatively. All right, Chief. Well, everything's good with you, like, uh, yeah? Yeah, we're okay. We're just ma- waiting for the album to come out, big tour at the end of the year, and we actually will tour America for the first time next March. Get In the like fuck out. Nine In years. March? Of, you know, March of next year, yeah, or my April, we're going to tour. Like, are you are you coming with someone else, or you have um, a package, or like, what's, what's I think happening? It's like, it's like we do Maryland Death Fest, and then we play oh, for okay. 10 days after that or something, but we, have, we actually have a day in L.A., if you can believe that. Oh, that's amazing. You have a date already? Um, sometime in... You don't have to tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it's not, in March, though? If not, we're doing all the tons of festivals next year, so... In Europe? Yeah. Um, I, well, we might be playing some other ones in the US, but yeah, we, we, I'm sure if, if you're doing festivals in Europe next summer or something, we'll be around. This one, this summer is a bit quiet, but you know. Yeah, for us too. Yeah, we're trying to get on 24 festivals as well, but it's 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 been really hard lately because of the world opening back up. Everybody and their brothers trying to get on the yeah, stage, you know. And everything is expensive, and yeah, the energy <sighs> costs have doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Yeah, it's crazy stuff happening. I'm not sure. It's, I'm not sure it's going to calm down, but maybe a little bit. I hope so. Let's end I on. I hope so. Let's end on that positive note.